Hi, this is Guy Wallace. Welcome to another video in my series, Adventures in Performance-Based Training and Development, with me, your host, Guy Wallace. This series is also entitled or subtitled, The Insomnia Solution. Not for my insomnia, but for yours. Just kidding. Today I'd like to talk about inputs as outputs model mashed up with the general systems model. So what I'm going to cover in this video is several prevailing uh, models I think of impact. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the general systems model, something I first saw Gary Rumler present on back in June of 1981 when I came in a week before my official start date to attend a workshop by Gary Rumler, a one-day workshop and so I've got a video clip of that I have uh, that I'll show at the end of this video of him explaining the general systems model. It was something that he and Dale Brethauer created when they were both back at the University of Michigan in the 1960s. So this model has a long history. Dale has a particular version of it, Gary has a particular version of it, but I'm using Gary's language for this. Um, because I saw him present on this and I have the video clip and I have some other artifacts of his. Uh, but Dale's is uh, um, a little bit different. But I, And I asked Gary at one point, you know, why did Dale call his one thing and you called it another? You know, who created this? And he said, well, we both did, but uh, Dale was holding the pen at the flip chart when we envisioned and created this model here. So I guess that's the story. Um, I'm, I'm changing their graphics a little bit uh, um, it, when I do this. I'm flipping their model from a kind of a left to right orientation to a upstream to downstream orientation. And so I've kind of flipped their model and I'm going to add some of the elements that Gary will later talk about in his clip of the video at the end of this here. So besides, uh, I have two models here. Basically the inputs is outputs model. Uh, which I created because I needed people to begin to understand, which they didn't seem to understand, but it's quite logical, that every output of a process becomes an input downstream, whether that's inside an enterprise or to the customer or to the supply chain, uh, the value chain, uh, whatever. But one needs to be cognizant of the fact that when you produce an output, its value, its worth is determined by the downstream users. And they may be adding something to it and then shipping it further downstream, which gets added to again. And so one needs to understand that entire chain. One needs to have what uh, Walter Scott, a uh, vice president of Motorola back in the uh, early 80s, uh, called line of sight. One of the issues, too often, too prevalent, is that people doing work don't understand further than they can see. If you're on a factory floor, you can see a certain portion of the manufacturing line and you may understand that a little bit, but if it goes to another building after that and gets worked on further, you don't have a clue often. And so that's one of the things that people need to understand is what are the measures by all the stakeholders, including the customers, internal and external, and it could be a chain of customers in the process, in the collection of processes. So that's what I'm gonna be looking at. Um, so I've got a fishbone diagram, which is something that I adapted from the Ishikawa diagram back in the, which I saw for the first time again in 1981 when I was at the Motorola's Training and Education Center at Motorola headquarters. We were the training group uh, that recently been put together in 1981 when I first joined them. Um, and I was exposed to lots of things from the total quality management, the TQM movement, if you will. Um, there had always been quality efforts and quality assurance and quality control and things like that. Um, design for quality was becoming a big thing. Um, and so I got exposed to all of that along with learning more from Gary Rumler, who I'd been influenced uh, by indirectly from others uh, when I first joined the training organization in August of 1979. So I happened to work with people who were familiar with Rumler's work, had worked with Gary Rumler's brother, Rick Rumler. I worked alongside of Gary Rumler's brother-in-law, Roger. So I was a Rumlerite, if you will, uh, going forward. So let's take a look at their original or a version of the general systems model as Gary labeled it. And now let's look at my output as input model. 
pretty simple, but now I'm going to flip that left to right orientation to an orientation from uh, top to bottom, upstream to downstream as it's often referred to when people are talking about processes and you are trying to understand the flow. So you get something like this, ye old process model is how I've uh, labeled it. Um, and then let me add one more element to this, the receiving systems. You would have seen that that's part of the general systems model. So there's a receiving system and that's, you know, the first of or at least one of potentially more receiving systems downstream from the operation that you're looking at, from the set of processes that you might be looking at. Um, then we can begin to add feedback and there's various kinds of feedback and some of it is uh, formal and some of it comes from informal means. So there's a measurement system there and it may be giving you quite formal feedback, consistent routine feedback and there can be other informal feedback. You might even be getting that consistently if uh, what you're producing isn't adequate. You may be getting the word back from somebody that's really not part of the formal measurement system that an organization has put in place to help them manage their processes, to help them manage their work. Um, so let's do a mashup now with another layer adding in, besides the feedback, consequences. Now there are those who might argue that consequences are also a form of feedback. But uh, yeah, so if you touch the hot stove and burn your hand, that's feedback. But some feedback is a little bit more uh, punishing, painful than other kinds of feedback. And so the, I've layered the, that in red in the diagram here to connote that, that this is basically a, a serious, significant feedback. Uh, you could get fired kind of feedback. Uh, you could hurt yourself. Um, so that's a little bit different than, than telling you what your rate of production is. Um, unless, of course, the boss comes along here and begins screaming and yelling about that, then that may be a little bit more punishing. And if they send you home for a day or two to think about it, that's even more punishing. And if they fire you, that's, you know, kind of the ultimate. Uh, other, other larger, more significant consequences for, could be people getting hurt on the job. Um, or hurt it hurt downstream 27 steps later that you may not even be aware of and they don't 27 steps later don't even know that you might have been the root cause of that so that's the concept anyway um, I like to draw those uh, feedback lines and uh, consequence lines in there again separately so that people can really begin to ex uh, distinguish between the formal and the informal and the uh, inert and the painful uh, kinds of feedback that they might get. So uh, next we want to look at some what enables the processes. Now I when I look at uh, when I do performance analysis I have three major things that I'm looking at. First is the process itself. Is the process, has the process been designed to generate outputs in a way that satisfies stakeholders? and stakeholder requirements. Do the outputs meet the stakeholder requirements? Does the operation of the process itself meet the stakeholder requirements? You know, regulators may not care about the products that you produce. They want to know about how you produced it. You know, not using child labor laws, not violating OSHA safety kinds of things. Um, and so there can be concerned on the outputs and the process itself. So the first thing I learned from Gary Rumler working with him was that look at the process. Is there one? And if there is, are people adhering to it? And if they're not adhering to it, why? Um, a joke that I was given by a, uh, somebody with, when I was doing analysis decades ago, back in the 80s, and I said, so tell me about the process. And their response was, well, are you talking about the Tuesday process or the Wednesday process? Because uh, today's Wednesday and we did it differently yesterday. And, you know, Thursday will be different too because we have no consistency how we do things. You know, and that was my first big clue that therein probably lies the problem and maybe training won't have to happen unless we put in a standard process and ask everybody to adhere to it. And we may have to make them aware of it, knowledgeable about it, and or skillful in it. So that depends on the process and the people that you're looking at and, you know, what do they already know from education, experience, etc. So if it's simply a matter of getting the process cleaned up, well, then you can stop. Maybe that'll solve all your problems. But if you begin to look beyond that, you're going to begin to look at what I call the environmental asset enablers. Um, 
So are the environmental assets available to the process adequate to its needs? So first start with the process, then you begin to look at the environment. And this, these uh, environmental assets include data and information, materials and supplies, tools and equipment, facilities and grounds, budget and headcount, and culture and consequences. Here's where the consequences comes up uh, overtly. Um, and because, so what I learned from Gary is that we tend to give the, the human being, the performer, the benefit of the doubt. And so we don't start looking at them and trying to figure out how to fix them. Um, both Rumler and uh, W. Edwards Deming both claimed that the problems, the root cause for most of these problems resided outside of the individual. Deming said that 94% of problems in the workplace are due to the system beyond the individual but in the control of management. And Rumler's numbers were that 80% of the problems that he encountered were due to things outside of the individual. It wasn't their knowledge and skills. It was something else. And so these were the models and tools that they used to diagnose those kinds of things. Um, so when I so the so I used this fishbone, if you will, uh, which I adapted from the Ishikawa diagram after I first you know I first saw it back in 1981, and sometime in the mid to late 90s I adapted this and I kind of mashed together or merged or reconfigured all of this based on the Ishikawa diagram itself, which used to have four things on the spine you know there's a process box and then there's the fish bone cause and effect diagram it's also known as but uh, the old one was the four m's model men machinery methods and materials and so quality uh, uh, improvement efforts often looked at you know what in those four buckets were the cause of a problem in the process now back in the old days I never heard anybody talk really about the process itself and that's the place to start but they always talked about looking at these four M's and using that to diagnose you know so what is it about the men or the materials or the machines and the methods that could be at the root or in combination with other variables at the root of a performance problem so I uh, so let me now layer on this upstream downstream process flow against the spine of the my fishbone diagram my version of that um, and when we're so you can do this at every level all the boxes on the left but if you were looking at one process box or processes be looking at greater than one process um, what we're looking at that are the tasks and steps or as some would for, refer to it, the steps and the tasks. You know, we're inconsistent in how we uh, label this and uh, organize our views of these things. But we're looking at, so what are the behaviors in the box that humans do uh, manipulating their environmental assets and utilizing the human assets that they and others bring to the process party, so to speak. So these behaviors that we look at are both the physical behaviors, the overt behaviors, we can see them, we can observe them, unless you know the hand is quicker than the eye, then we need to slow things down. But there's also the cognitive behaviors, the covert behaviors, the things that we cannot see. And when people are making decisions, discriminations, um, uh, you know, we have a hard time understanding that. And of course, we can ask the performers, you know, what are you thinking? And they'll usually give us an answer, you know, sometimes if they're honest, they'll say, I don't know, I'm just doing it. Um, it's because uh, our behaviors, our, our, co our covert uh, cognitive behaviors are things that we ourselves don't understand because we've put most of that stuff into our non-conscious memory. We don't know what we're doing, we're just doing it. We're calling upon our non-conscious memory to help guide us doing the performance, but we have a hard time articulating it. In fact, the research shows that an expert, and really every last person on the planet, the, we will all miss 70% of what a novice needs to perform. We will forget the nuance, the details. Um, we'll, we'll just be presumptuous as we're explaining things 
um, you know, n not deliberately, but but quite inadvertently. So even if uh, you, an analyst, and the subjects that you're talking to understand quite clearly that the experts will miss 70 percent, they still won't be able to get much better than that. Um, the good news, according to Richard E. Clark, Dick Clark, who taught me all of this uh, 15, 20 years ago, uh, is that each expert, each person forgets, has parked into non-conscious memory um, a different 70%. So if you talk to enough of them, you'll eventually tease out, you know, a majority of it. It'll never be perfect and you're going to have to, you know, pilot test and test things out and uh, uh, it, uh, add to what you first capture. So we have to be wary about that when we're talking to uh, experts. We like to call them subject matter experts. I prefer dealing with master performers, but it doesn't matter. They're all subject to the same uh, uh, fault, faulty memory. Um, so let's look at this now when we layer onto our model here, feedback, and now the consequences. And we should understand that feedback and especially consequences is what drives behavior. Gary Rumler will speak to that in a moment. So in summary, we're look, first of all, we look at the process, then we look at the environmental assets to determine are they adequate to the needs of the process the process demands things, do they have sufficient environmental assets in order to feed the process and meet its needs. And then we look at the human assets and we look at the awareness, knowledge and skills. We can look at the physical attributes that people bring to the job. We can look at their psychological attributes that they bring to the job. We can look at their intellectual attributes and we can look at their personal values to see if all of that is conducive to the demands of the process. And it either is or isn't. And that's the trick in the game. So again, my adaptation of the Ishikawa diagram influenced by Tom Gilbert's behavior engineering model. This is Guy Wallace. Adventures in performance-based training and development with me, your host, Guy Wallace. This series is also entitled or subtitled The Insomnia Solution. Not for my insomnia, but for yours. Just kidding. All right, here's the training function, and here's the receiving system, the organization. And there's this thing out here called the performer. And uh, I think there are two very important things to understand about a performer, and they are essential to how one goes about doing analysis and designing performance-based training. Premise one, is that there is, or had better be, this kind of linkage. My point is that there is such linkage always in situations. There's a performer that emits little bundles of things called behavior and a little bit of luck they end up in clumps which accomplish tasks. With more luck, those tasks actually contribute to a job or output, job output or accomplishment. And with lots of luck, there's some connection between that and an organization output. Uh, so I say that linkage does exist. I think what some of you were saying earlier, the frustration is getting an organization to articulate what that linkage is, because organizations are really keen on coming to us and talking to us at this end. Okay? You guys put in the knowledge and skills, and somehow, with a little bit of luck, we'll get this out the other end. And it's very much like pushing 50 foot of wet rope to make that, that happen. So I'm a firm believer that you pull performance out rather than you push behavior in. We've got to link individual performance to organization performance, and if we don't do that, it's, it's uh, basically all over as a, as a performance-based training game. A minute. Okay, now that's, that's premise number one. Premise number two is that uh, performers 
That very same performer that was emitting all those arrows a few minutes ago exists in a mystical thing which I call a performance system. And uh, that that, if you take into recognition that they exist in such a thing, there's a lot of power in sorting out what we can do with training, what we can't do with training, and what we, in fact, uh, have to do to support our particular training. Now, let me just quick ask, how many people have seen this picture before? Okay, good. Yes, <laughs> We won't eat lunch today in order to be sure to stay awake. Uh, excuse me. One of the things about performance systems is they frequently go out of focus. Okay, let's take a couple minutes to talk about this because it's, it's, it's a key way. You know, people have talked about things called deficiencies of knowledge versus deficiencies of execution, and uh, Bob Mager talks about separating training problems from non-training problems, etc. cetera. Uh, this is supportive of that. This I just find to be a useful framework to get in your heads to, to uh, listen to training problems with and also to teach managers to, to look at what they do a little differently. It says the following, that you can look at any organization performance in this way, that you've got a performer that in some given occasion has a, a signal or they want the performer to take some action, make a decision, do something. Uh, and that's your basic stimulus response hookup. Also, we know that for any response that a performer takes or makes and or doesn't take or make, there's some consequence to that performer of making that response. All right? um, that is pretty straightforward. So key point number one is behavior is influenced by its consequences. Basically, people don't do things that lead to negative consequences, and they do those things that lead to positive consequences. All right? It's fundamental uh, to the world. It's important to understand here that we're talking about a consequence to the performer for making the response, not necessarily a consequence to the organization. That's an important distinction because organizations think about the consequences to themselves, not to the people. So they'll say things like, Diane, if you don't put the widget on the Framus properly, in three weeks, the Framus is going to fall off. Well, the Framus falling off in three weeks is a consequence to the organization. It frequently ain't no skin off Diane's nose. Uh, in fact, Organizations are no dummies. They know if they can ship it within two weeks, it's not even going to be a consequence to them. Um, that's, that's some kind of consequence downstream here to the organization. What we're concerned about are the consequences in the immediate performance system of Diane. Because if she puts, takes time to put the widget on the Framus, that means that she's not going to be able to do two other things, get out a management report, and get to the carpool in time. And those are the kinds of consequences that have a lot to do with whether people do anything or not. So that's what we're concerned about. And then uh, uh, fifth, the feedback on those consequences. Some information coming back to the performer saying, here's what's, what's happening. Now, I would argue that all performance can be looked at as part of that five-part system. And point number two is that poor performance can result from a breakdown in one or more of the components of the performance system. Now, it's a, our, it tends to be management's favorite myth that when you don't get the response you want, that's a function of the performer. Either they don't give a damn or they don't know how to do it right. And that's, of course, how so many of our training programs get, uh, get introduced. And uh, I would argue that, from my experience, uh, aside from just initial training, about 80% of the time when you don't get the response you want is for some reason other than you've got a bum performer. So that leads to the conclusion that when we play this game, we usually give the performer the benefit of the doubt. When we don't get the performance we want, where we're going to tend to operate is on the assumption we've got a good performer and let's look for someplace else to see where the system has broken down. And point number three, this puts the performer in I don't know if it's proper perspective, but it puts the performer in perspective with the environment. You, as far as I'm concerned, you cannot take performers out of their performance system and abstract and deal with them and bend them around, which is what a lot of training is all about. Uh, just give me a quick, bar, you? No, a quick uh, example of that. Um, one of my favorite example situation is the following. Airline passenger has three bags walks up to the ticket agent. That's the performer in question. All right. The airline has a very simple request. They 
wish the ticket agent to make under those circumstances, and it's basically, um, excuse me, but you can check two of those bags for free, but I'm going to have to charge you $2 excess baggage charge for the third bag. Pretty simple. You know, organizations are filled full of such wonderful requests, okay? Makes sense. Now, there are going to be some consequences to the performer of doing that. Uh, to our ticket agent of saying two dollars please. Uh, the source of that consequence, the most immediate consequence is going to be who? What's the source? Customer. customer. Now a customer could make a number of responses in, uh, under those circumstances. Um, things like, you know, God damn, great. You know, I had some extra change I wanted to get rid of, so uh, when I go through the, um, the uh, security machine, it won't tag it off. You know, it's a system that they use in Mexico City with the airport tax. You know, oh, you still got 100 pesos? It's the airport tax. Uh, well, there's a range of possible consequences that, that uh, could come to our ticket agent at this point. You know, I suspect that they're going to tend to be more on the order of, you what? You want $2 more? I just paid $840 round trip on this goddamn airline, and now you want to charge me $2 excess baggage charge? What kind of a chicken outfit do you work for? And who's your supervisor? Okay. That's for openers. Now, it's conceivable that that kind of a response from the customer would register as a negative consequence for the ticket agent. Okay. And if I happen to be the customer, I work hard at setting it up that way. Now, if this ticket agent persists in this foolishness after that first round, uh, of response. We've got another consequence, which is very typical of the consequences we set up in organizations inadvertently, all right? Now, you know and I know that there's no way that an organization in a civilized world can handle an influx of $2 cash without filling out at least one five-part form. Can't do it. One, $2 might not get into the cash register if we didn't fill out the form. Probably more significantly, if the $2 got into the cash register without the supporting paperwork, the accounting department would spend $1,500 trying to find out where the $2 came from. All right? So regardless of the reason, you've got to fill out the five-part form. Now, based on your experience, just think about it. Do you think that the forms necessary to handle this transaction are stacked neatly in great abundance at each workstation at the old ticket counter? Unlikely. Got to find the damn thing. All right. Well, who's got form 583? No, it's not 583 anymore. This year's 594. Well, anybody got it? Get it back. Come back. Two or three minutes are going by now. If your customer wasn't upset initially, now they're getting that way. Plus, the people behind the customer are backing up, and the noise is going up. Language is going up. Ticket agents hearing language they never heard in the training form. Really? You can do that, huh? Yeah. So, uh, I have to tell Martha. Well, so they're, you know, now we got to fill out the form, uh, name, rank, serial number, height, weight, etc. Handle the transaction at two dollars. Right, by this time, you know, it ain't good. I mean, uh, that's the second consequence, fairly negative. At this point, there's a third consequence. Doesn't always happen, but it happens just enough. That's the fact that the back door opens up behind the ticket counter. My experience is, you know, there's usually two unmarked doors. You're standing at the ticket counter, and uh, you're waiting. Looking, it's, it's pretty Eastern Airlines, and you're. It's eight minutes to boarding time, and you're four people away from, from the, uh, the ticket counter. And uh, the door opens up, and you say, oh, thank God, it's help, you know. And it's usually someone comes up with a cup of coffee in their hand. They kind of stagger out, and they take a look at the long line. It's sort of like the, the great figurine Swiss clocks. And they come out one door, see there's work to be done, and go right back in the other door. <laughs> Clank. Okay. Well, in this case, the door opens up, and it's not your ordinary folk. It's the supervisor. The supervisor looks out and sees this long line backing up across the lobby and says, what in hell is going on? Goes to the head of the line and says, excuse me, Bill, uh, what's the problem? He goes, ah, I caught this so-and-so trying to slip two bucks past the company here. No, oh, well, now we got a chance for the supervisor to make a response. You know, it's a wide range of possible responses. You know, could be, gee, Bill, that's terrific. Vigilance is next to cleanliness, which is next to godliness. It's highly valued in our organization. Unlikely. The response is going to be more skewed along the end of our Christ's sake. Take the form, tear it up, give the two bucks back to the customer, have the, the uh, sky cap come down, hand carry the customer down to the gate, and uh, turn around, go back in the little door, mumbling something about lowered hiring standards, EEO compliance, and where's the training department when I need them, kind of thing. All right? So that about does it. The ticket agent has had it. Uh, what kind of information is coming back to our ticket agent on those consequences? Uh, I mean, it's, it's dynamite. Ed Feeney would love it. It's direct, it's immediate, it's frequent, it's specific. And it all says, 
You gotta be crazy to collect for excess baggage charges in this organization. But maybe there's hope. Down here, we gotta have some organizational consequences, um, probably because they're making me go through all this aggravation of collecting two dollars is, maybe there's some information that's gonna come back to the ticket agent that could offset what's just happened in the immediate performance system. Maybe there's some information that comes back that says, here's how you're doing against the month's plan for excess baggage charges. Or here's how you're doing this month against last month. Or here's how you're doing national, Washington National against LaGuardia, against O'Hare, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Sorry. No information. Airline doesn't track excess baggage charges. So that kind of ends our little, our little performance system of the ticket agent. Okay. Poor performance can result from a breakdown in one or more of the components. Why is the ticket agent not doing it? Because they're bad, malicious, poorly trained. They're doing it because the performance system says it doesn't make any sense to do that. Uh, now, that well and good, ticket agent probably isn't going to do that. In fact, they don't even see excess baggage anymore. You know, the uh, sky cap can wheel up with a cart stacked to the ceiling and uh, you know, just check those babies through because it's too much aggravation. We got a balance of consequences set up so that people have got to be crazy to do what they've been told they're supposed to do. Now, where the rub comes for most organizations is that the ticket agent forgets it and everybody else forgets it and we're business as usual, except in this case, the vice president of marketing for the airline comes whipping through Newark Airport someday and uh, sitting there waiting for a plane because there aren't any planes that fly out of Newark anymore and uh, notices that ticket agents are letting people get on the airplanes without the appropriate amount of corporate hassle, i.e. they're not being charged for excess baggage charges. So this really offends the vice president of marketing. So he or she gets on the airplane, got a little time to kill, so they write a memo to the vice president of operations with a copy to the vice president of personnel, making an observation about what they just saw in the field. Okay, now again, we have a wide range of possible responses here, but I will lay you apples to donuts that what the vice president of marketing is going to say in the way of a description is something like the following. I was in the field and I observed that ticket agents, here's, here's the critical thing, that ticket agents don't know how to collect for excess baggage charges. Now, but, you know, it wouldn't, you know, it would, a service it would be if they would just say, I was in the field and I observed that ticket agents aren't collecting excess baggage charges. Eh? But no, you can't raise a problem in organizations without proposing a solution. So I was in the field and I observed that ticket agents don't know how to collect excess baggage charges. Same problem, didn't see this, assume it's this. So the vice president of personnel gets the memo, doesn't look good, calls up the training director. Says, Bill, would you come in here, please? Talk to me about this. Uh, we got a problem here. Bill says, no, sorry. And our three-week introductory training course for new ticket agents, second Tuesday, 9 to 12, we cover excess baggage charges, and I got it on videotape. Nah, 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 nah. Okay. And the vice president of personnel says, I never really trusted that media crap anyhow. Nothing like a good stand-up instructor. And uh, whatever you're doing in training, it's not working. And what I want you to do is to get on your white horse or silver bird, whatever you use. And I want you to get out in the field, and I want you to retrain, refresh your train, whatever, OK? Every time I hear the, the re in front of a re training request, it sends off a little performance system alarm uh, running up or down my spine. and. Uh, so now a training program is born. And so the training department goes out, and what are we doing? What are we saying here? This is the, this is the, the important third point. Okay, what we're saying is the performer isn't performing properly, supposedly. The, the faulty, comp well, that's point number two, really. The faulty component in our performance system is the person, is the performer. Thereby, they must be repaired. So what we're going to do is take them out of the real performance system, and we're going to send them off to the repair department, okay? And who's the repair department? You know, human performance repair department. That's us guys, right? So we got them now. We got them out of the context, and what do we do? Be mildly facetious, you know? We say, well, we gotta train them. We gotta retrain them here. What are we gonna do? Depending on your budget, you use four by six cards or video vignettes, and you 
you know, we put together kind of the S prime because it's it's not the performance system, it's done in training, not the real one. We simulate it. See, we show them a picture of a passenger. Say, what is that? You say, passengers, very good. Not a visual discrimination problem. How many bags do they have? Three. Well, it's not a counting deficiency. We're moving right along. Smarter class than I thought. Maybe they don't know what they do when they see one of those. OK. What do you do? Unison. Gotcha. Good. Two dollars of your life. Okay. And we go through all that. And the consequences are very positive in our training situation. And the feedback is very immediate and direct, et cetera. And God, in just a matter of a few short days, people knew what they did when they came in. All right. One thing we've gained is that we can certify that they've been trained. We put a tag on their toe and we send them back in the performance system. Well, the organization has not changed the standards in any way. They haven't said, hey, maybe it ain't too smart to have our ticket agents collect for excess baggage charges between 5 and 8 p.m. on Fridays and Sundays at O'Hare, Washington National, and Kennedy. Because, in fact, if they really did it, they'd bring the whole place, you know, shut the whole place down worse than they are controller strike. All right? They haven't done that. They haven't changed the resources. They haven't changed the form in some way to facilitate the trainee doing what we want them to do. Haven't changed the consequences in any way. And we argue, what are we going to do about passengers? They're outside our domain. We can't control that. That's baloney. Some airlines do a very good job of managing the customer. So the customer knows 15 minutes and 500 feet in advance that this is going to happen. And there are no support surprises. And the ticket agent doesn't get dumped on. All right, That's a possibility. If we can't, in fact, control our supervisors to keep them from coming out and dumping on our employees, then we should be out of business. I mean, my God. But we haven't done any of that stuff. And now we take our fully trained, ticket, retrained ticket agent, and we shove them back in that performance system. And everyone is amazed in six weeks when they've once again contracted the terminal case of the dumbs or whatever. So the performance system, in my mind, is a way of positioning any performer in terms of trying to understand what else is operating, of asking some questions and saying, hey, what's not there that should be there, and separating training from non-training. But the other thing is, if we're going to train, understanding that these other pieces have got to be in place. Because if there's any one thing out of whack in the performance system, we ain't going to get it. Okay. We ain't going to get it. Now. If it gets you to believe that there's such a thing as a performance system, then you ought to be able to get you to believe that we could probably specify the characteristics of an ideal performance system. And in fact, you know we can. There's nothing new on here, except that we, you know, I'm, there's a, for some reason, the characteristics on feedback didn't make the, the cut here, but uh, basically that it has to be specific and frequent and immediate. But we know that, right? We know all there is to get performance in an organization. That we know all there is to manage performance or to engineer performance in an organization. But in fact, what we do in most organizations is wish for performance. So what this says here is if you really want performance management, this is what you got to do. This is the ideal. Damn it all. If you want people to collect for excess baggage charges, it ain't no big secret about how to get them to do that. You got to have these things in place. To the extent you don't have those things in place, you're unlikely to get excess baggage charges collected. It's as simple as that. I mean, well, it's as simple as that conceptually. It's tough in organizations because we've got ourselves in a mentality of kind of programs, which is when something doesn't happen, we assume there's one thing wrong. If we can find the one program for it, you know, we can send them off to get that program and they all come back. Where, in fact, what we've got to do in organizations is keep some balance in that performance system. And I would argue that that's what is important for managers to be able to do, is to be able to manage the performance system. Not manage people, but manage the performance system. Because so much of the, of the people problems in organizations is a function of these other components being out of whack and people just trying to survive. Now, 